people and taking notes. Um, then for anybody who is here observing, we'd like to have you at some point go over and get your name on a list that's over at the staff table here. I, I brought it, uh, it's, it's, it's circling. Oh, now it's circling. So you can just wait for it to come to you to sign. Uh, and then I think we are going, we have to go through the process of accrediting new members. So we'll do that first. And then Basha is going to give a presentation on how we're voting because we have a new system this year. And then the third thing we'll do is approve the agenda. Okay. Um, and I think Jim is online. Is that right? Our Canadian co-chair? Yep. Awesome. Okay. Um, so that's that's kind of our game plan for getting started here. Um, so let's start with the new organizations to accredit. The U.S. will accredit, I think we just have one, and Canada will accredit any new organizations or make a determination on any new applicants for the conference board from Canada. So I'll turn it over to you. By you to me, me. Hello? No, sorry. Uh, turning it over to Basha to okay. talk about who has applied for accreditation. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you and welcome everyone. As Linda mentioned, I will be just uh, guiding you through the accreditation of the new members in support of this process. So here the slide is just a reminder about the terms of reference and rules of procedures related to the accreditation. The full process is available in the rules of procedures available on our website. And uh, as a reminder, conference board members are Pacific Halbut harvester organizations and associations from each contracting party and include commercial guided sport recreational and guided sport recreational subsistence and First Nation tribal interests. Members are responsible for designating their individual delegates, and no delegate may vote on behalf of more than one conference board member. The conference board regulates membership by accrediting members at the beginning of each conference board session. Accreditation is documented using accreditation questionnaire provided in the Annex 1 of the Rules of Procedure as well as on the form available on our website. Conference board members might be re-accredited for successive meetings for a period of five years from the initial accreditation by a simple roll call at the beginning of the conference board session if they have participated in at least three conference board annual meetings within the five-year period. Previously accredited organizations all fulfill this requirement. Conference board members not meeting this criteria would have to fill the accreditation form. And this also applies to returning conference board members after this period. As a reminder, accreditation of a conference board uh, in 2021, conference board accredited 26 new members in, from Canada and 40 members uh, from United States for participation in the 2021 conference board proceedings. In 2022, there were no new members accredited, and in 2023, one new member from the United States was accredited. For this year, we have uh, four submissions for accreditation of new, from new organizations, and these are organizations uh, uh, visible on this slide here, and I will turn to you, Linda, to proceed with uh, those four organizations and Jim, of course, for the Canadian organizations listed here. So I think the one um, U.S. organization that has requested accreditation is the American Sport Fishing Association. They submitted a written application that was online um, on the under the conference board agenda item. So if there's no objection to adding them as an accredited member, we will add them. I don't think we've done this by vote in the past, right? Yeah. I don't believe so. Yeah. Okay. So we'll add them. And that's all we have from the U.S. side. Okay. From the Canadian side, we have two, um, the finance at, C, the finance at C, Seafood, so SAF, 
and Atlagay Fisheries are actually previous members of the Conference Board for Canada, but I don't know if they filled an accreditation uh, in the years previous to this. Um, I know FAS has filled one in, and I can't, I don't know if Atlagay filled one in on the board. I remember talking to Krista. Uh, are you there, Krista? Or maybe she can't talk. Uh, Basha, does does that like have a? Did they fill out a form? Because I know they they already have another person there that's I think in person. Thank you, Jim. Yes, they they filled the form, and Krista is available online, so we can also hear from her. If the secretary please allow the microphone, Krista Russell. Krista. I don't think she heard you. No? Yeah, if you would unmute Krista, we'd give her a chance to speak. Okay, so Krista's now unmuted. Jim, did you have a, a question? So Krista, there's already a, a member here for Atlagay. I am under a different company named Atlagay Fisheries LP. Oh, okay. So it's a separate one. My, yeah, right. You told me that. Sorry. Okay, okay. So it's a separate, it's a, it's a separate one. Yeah. Okay. And I have the accreditation form with Baja and we're yeah. all good. I think. Okay. Um, and active guide fishing and tackle, Derek, I've seen your application. So does anyone in Canada, I mean, they all meet the criteria for organizations. Do you, any objections to these? Uh, three groups being accredited and just speak up because I can't see anybody. Okay. So do we want to take a roll or we just leave it at that? Um, there's someone in the room. Is that relative to the accreditation process? Yes. Um, have we... USA. So, <laughs> um, so let's just wrap up the Canadian. Let's stay on for. Um, I, before we move on to another U.S. group, but so I we have not voted on this in the past it's just been a sort of does anybody object basis or are there any questions so i think jim if nobody on um, nobody on the canadian side has a delegate has an objection they're accredited yeah good okay yeah okay did we have somebody else yes, um, yes my name is paul moranti and when i registered um, I think it was Andrea showed that I was on a list and it's not there. I've got, I was issued this also. Uh, what association? Westport Charter Boat Association. This mic is now. It doesn't work. It keeps beeping. Maybe now. Try that. I probably broke it. Um, so you are on the list, Westport Charter Boat Association, right? When I check, you're on our list, Paul Morante. You're second from the bottom on my voting list. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, anybody else we missed? If you can see the list, um, I was just curious. Um, question for clarification. I thought the conference board is for organizations, whereas the PAD is for uh, processors and uh, seafood corporations. And I see finest at sea seafoods on the list. And from what at least what I can gather off a quick internet research, that looks like a vertically integrated processing company that owns vessels. And, and I'd love to just know more why they're not on the PAD and why here.
It's actually two different companies. One is the finance producers, and the other one is the processing company. I represent the producers. So is that an organization or a company? I represent the organization of the fishermen that for the company. Thank you. I don't think we've ever had that kind of a query before. Yeah, can you disconnect that last mic? Because when he was speaking, it was flashing on and off and making him break up. This mic is in the chain of them. If we disconnect one, it's going to disconnect the rest of the chain. But I will let the other uh, technicians know, and I'll be right back. That one's breaking up too. That was making everybody break up. Yeah. Okay. Well, why they keep working on that? If there's no more questions, I think our next step is to have Basha give a presentation on the voting, right? And that won't mess with the mics while she does that, right? Okay, so Basha's, I thought we wanted to do the presentation while we made sure our list was finalized, but I guess we're going to do the roll call uh, as part of finalizing the list and handing out clickers, and then we're, we'll go through how to use the clickers. We have a new voting system this year. Okay, so I'm going to go through, so is there a way to unmute people online so if I call their name, they can respond? Um because there's a lot of people not in the room and I really don't have a sense of who is online. Okay, so just get, let us know if you're here when you hear your name. Um, Lenny Herzog, Area 4, Concerned Fisherman. Is he online? No, okay, so not present. Aliut Kaur. Present. Alaska Charter Association. Present. ADAC Community Development Corporation. Present. Well, that's why. It, well, let's just, let me just finish. So, Alpha. Present. Or do you have to have them distributed to the certain person at the moment? Oh. Okay. Well, are you ready? Are you ready to do that? So I think we just do it slower. Okay. And, we can distribute it to the person, and if we just confirm the name as well. Okay, so Lenny Herzog is in here. So Chase um, Berenson, Ali, of course, sorry if I butcher people's names. So who's distributing the clickers? There's a couple of uh, comments online about does the secretary turn on the microphones for the people or they're supposed to click on an icon above their on the top of their screen. I'm going to have to put my laptop on so I can see people. Are we ready on the clickers or?
Check, check. Yeah, it seems like the mic's working. Do we have the clickers to hand out now? So the first one is AFS. That's true, yeah. So AC, ACA, so for, they're first US. And to like to them to distribute them like, I'm not sure how otherwise they wouldn't know who comes who. I won't have people go over there and pick them up. Think. Okay, I think what we're going to do is go through the roll call. The clickers seem to be taking a while. Um, then we'll take a break and people can go pick up their clickers. And then we'll have the presentation on how to use the clickers. How about that? No, Jim thinks that's a bad idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I didn't say a word. Oh, no, sorry. Different Jim. <laughs> Who's shaking his head at me? Um, okay, so I think we got through ADAC Community Development Corporation, who was here, right? Um, Alpha, it's not Dan. That's Dick. Did he say here? Great, there he is. Okay. That's Dick Curran there, if you want to change that. Okay, and Angel Drabnica from Aleutian Pribilof Island Community Development Association. Present. Great. Do we need to read names or just organizations? You want both? It, was, it would be helpful. Okay. All right. Um, Rebecca Skinner, Alaska Whitefish Trawlers Association. Right here. There she go. Okay. Um, Larry Phillips, American Sport Fish Association. Steve Ricci, Bristol Bay Economic Development Court. We have the online people unmuted, Tara, is that right? They have to activate. Okay, so Steve Ricci, is there anybody online from BBDC? No, okay. All right, Brian Ritchie, Catch Association. Uh, Duncan Fields, Cape Barnabas. Duncan is not here right now. He's at the meeting though. Um, Joe Kashir, Kashivarov, I should have that name down. Sorry about that. Here. Thank you, with um, Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association. Dave Kroonquist, Central Conservation Association. Not here, not online. Okay. Um, Mark Carroll, CDFU. Here. Joel Karahara, Coastal Trollers. Not here. Paul Wilkins, Coastal Village. Not here. Sean McManus, Deep Sea Fishermen's, great. Michael Offerman, Edmonds Veteran Independent Longliners. Not online, not here, okay. Jim Armstrong, Freezer Longline Coalition. Not here. I, I think he's in the building, but he's not in the room. Okay, I won't, okay. Um, pair or... Odegaard, is Pair online for FVOA? I'm here for FVOA. Oh, you're here for, oh, remind me of your name. And we'll get Ryan it written. Daffer. Ryan Daffer. Okay. For FVOA. Okay. Tim Clausen, Humboldt Area Saltwater Anglers. 
Tom Gemmel, Halibut Coalition. Present. Clay Duda, Homer Charter Association. I'm I'm sitting in for Clay. This is Daniel Donich. Daniel Donich. Okay. Okay, Kareel, the sergeant, is Kareel in the room? No, I'm not here. All right. Jim Hubbard, Cruise Off Fisheries. Linda Kozak, KVOA. Garrett Elwood, Next Generation Fishermen's Association. I think Garrett's online, right? Not sure our online is working for everybody, but maybe somebody text him and see if. Okay, because um, I know he intended to participate. He's not on right now. Okay. Um, Malcolm Bryant, thank you. To Thorn, that's how his name is spelled. Thank you, um, Malcolm Milne, MPFA. Great, uh, Patty Phillips. Pacific Here. Fisher, great. Nels Evans, PBOA. Tom Marking, Recreational Fishing Alliance, California. Yeah, I'm here. Great. Jim Martin, Recreational Fishing Alliance National. Not here. Kathy Hansen with CIFA. Is she able to... She's on. But but she can't speak if she can't activate her mic. It's not going to work very well for people if they can't speak. So hopefully, yeah, we'll get that sorted out. Um, Forrest, Seago, Forrest Braden, Seago, thanks. Paul Clampett, Sable Fish and Halibut Port Association. Pot Association, sorry. Nobody representing them? Are they online? Can anybody? No? Okay. Linda, they just gave me microphone access. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> Phil Wyman, Sitka Halibut and Sable Fish Marketing Association. Here, Carter Hughes, Seafood Producers Cooperative. He's online. He was having the same problem I was. Okay, here but can't speak. Jeff Kaufman, St. Paul Fishing Company. Here. Simeon Swetsoff, Tribal Government of St. Paul. Simeon's here, isn't he? There you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeff Stevens, United Fishermen Marketing Association. Not here. And Paul Morante, West Boat Charter. We have great Laundry Price, Yukon Delta Fisheries Association. Here. Great. Okay. I think that's all the U.S. side. Uh, Jim, if you want to go through the go through Canada. Sure. Okay, Daniel Smith, Atlegate Fishery Society. I'm here. Okay. Tara Henshaw, Annabelle Halibut Association. He was here yesterday. Okay. He's not here. Terry's not. Uh, I don't okay. think he's online either. Sean Copper, Council of Haida Nation. John, Bruce Turris, Commercial Integrated Ground Fish Society. Tom Russell, Canadian Sable Fish Association. I am present. Okay, wait to finish it now. I, I gotta be able to read these things. Okay. Yeah, Tom Russell, I'm present online. Okay. Daryl, Diddy Dad First Nation, they're not here. Uh, David Boys, Halibut Advisory Board. Online. Okay. Uh, it's not Lauren Iverson for Halibut Long Lines Fisherman Association. Uh, who is it? Rob Stanley here. Thanks, Rob. Hook and Line Groundfish Association, Ken Wing. Did you say something? Here. Okay. Because I can't see you. Nicole Fredrickson, IMOG. 
Anyone from IMOG? Northern Halibut Producers Association, Douglas Maven. I thought he was here. Jim, it's Chris Spore. Doug is, I think he's online, but he might not have any connect, connectivity issues. Let me let me just see if we can get yeah, in touch with him. I thought I heard him last night. Hi, Jim. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. This is uh, Jessica from IMOG. Um, sorry, I took me a second to unmute my microphone there. Who are you? Uh, Jessica, I'm the new biologist for IMOG. Nicole will okay. be popping on in just a couple minutes. Sure. What's the last name? Moffat, M-O-F-F-A-T-T. -T. Okay. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Robert Hockness, Northern Trollers Association. Here. Cliff at you know, the Channel Tribal Council. So Cliff is not here. So I will vote in that, that one. Um... Zeke Pellegrin, Pacific Coast Fishing Vessel Owners Guild. Zeke? Uh, Jim, it's Chris Spore. I think Zeke is online too. He might be having uh, connection problems. He just texted me. Okay. Chris, Pacific Halibut, Chris Spore, Chris Halibut Management Association. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Jerry Christensen, Sports Fish Advisory Board, Maine. Jerry? Or is it Martin? No, Martin. Yeah, Martin might be Maine. No, no Jerry is Maine. But he's not here. Okay. That's unusual. So he may be having troubles. Okay. So there might be Mike troubles. Mike yeah, Fowler. Sports Fish Advisory Board North. I know Mike's here. Because we were just talking this morning. Oh, okay. Um, maybe some microphone issues. Chuck Ashcroft, Fortress Advisory Board South. I'm here. Thanks. Yeah. Owen Bird, Sports Fishing Institute of BC. Owen's here. He had to step out for a few minutes. If you need, I can call him in, Jim. That's okay. We know he's here. Christopher Boss, South Vancouver Island Anglers Coalition. I'm here. Oh. Are you? And Jer or? Jerry Christensen is shown as being in the guest list on the slide. What was that? Jerry Christensen is shown as being on the phone and guest list on the side. And this is Jerry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, finally. Stupid 83-year-old finally figured out how to activate his mic. <laughs> well, that's why you need your great gam kids. Uh, okay, Christopher Boss. Uh, then we, Tyra Boys, Tuna Fishing Association. Did I pronounce that right? Nope. Russell Cameron, United Fisherman. Oh, who keeps jumping around with the screen? You missed Angus. You okay. did. Angus Grout, Stevenson Halibut Association. I'm here on online. Okay. Christopher Boss. Okay. Russell Cameron, United Fishermen's and Allied Workers Union. I thought Russell was there. Russell is. He just texted me. He's online. Oh, okay. He says he has no mic. He, he says he has no mic. Mike's not over working. Let me check. Lyle Pierce, Vancouver Island Longline Association. Lyle was here yesterday. Uh, yeah, Lyle might have to join later today or tomorrow. I had a hospital thing you got to deal with. So. Okay. Um, Pat Ahern, West Coast Fishing Guide Association. Pat? Pat might be away right now. He might be jumping on a little bit later. Okay. I thought he was I thought he was on I in person. He was on this morning. He had to go to an appointment this afternoon, but I think he might be okay. on this afternoon. Ted Brookman, Wildlife Federation. Ted's not here. I've replaced him, David Lewis. David Lewis, Wildlife Federation. Thanks, David. 
Welcome. Did I miss anybody? Um, Jim Armstrong uh, is here now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but Jim, you're on the U.S. side, so oh. don't add them to the Canadian side. We'll get you when they're finished. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jim, I'm not sure if you did the uh, not accredited yet one. Is, is Derek Crepin from the Active Guy in Tackle? I'm sorry, I jumped on late. Sorry, I can't. I, uh, my screen is blank here. That's usually me. <laughs> no, it's 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 with the thing. So what what is the organization? Uh, Active Guiding and Tackle Limited. Yeah, so Derek Creefing, Active Guiding and Tackle Limited. Yeah, so you were accredited just a you know, few okay. moments ago, right? Yes. And Krista Russell, Acclegay Fisheries LP. I'm here. Okay. Uh, and I think that's it because we've got Ben Cameron at FAS. So that's it for the. Did I miss anyone on the Canadian side? Okay. What are my messages here? You missed it. Okay. All right, great. Well, I think we have Jim Armstrong has um, showed up for the Freezer Longline Coalition to add to our list. I I was told that Myron is sitting in for Simeon. You should come up to the table, Myron. Um, so. I think Garrett Elwood is online now. Well. Yeah, I'll okay. get, I'm just, Myron, you are, Trying to find you on here. Uh, remind me which group? Tribal government, St. Paul. Paul is Myron. Okay. Um, and then Garrett Elwood was is online for the Next Generation Fishermen's Association. So I think we end up with thirty-two, maybe, um, on the U.S. side. Okay, and then maybe Tara, can I just ask you, or um, what is the best way to distribute clickers? Do you want people to come to you, and maybe we do the A's first? Okay, okay, and U.S. and Canada separately, or do you have them together? Together. Okay, so let's do it in groups. Um, let's start with anybody, and it's by organization when I say well, alphabetical, right? Okay. So any organization that starts with an A for Canada and the U.S., please go get your clicker. I am not sure where to get a clicker. How is it working for people online? Okay, so people online are going to have a different way to vote. Okay. And once the people in the room have their clickers, we will, Basha will explain the voting clicker and online process. Hey, Linda. Yes. Um, when you're done with distributing the clickers, maybe you could have everybody that is actually on the conference board raise their hand because a lot of them haven't been given mics by IPHC staff yet. Mm. Like, like Russell Cameron hasn't been given a mic ability yet. And I know, and I've seen others in the list, so. So there are people we missed on the roll call because they still can't access their mic, is that right? No, I'm, I think you might have accessed them, but they're not going to be able to participate with no Mac, mic. So I think we need to get them active. Okay, mic. maybe what we'll do is get clickers passed out and then we will take a break while the staff figures out how to make sure everybody has a mic because Canada also has an issue, it sounds like. Myron's last name is Melodoff. Hey, Chris, I'm just calling tech support. Ooh. 
Hey, Linda, this is Carter. Um, I was able to activate my mic. Yeah, when tech support's just arrived. Thanks. By, well, when it's gray, if you, if you I can't, it. My, the microphone is not working. And so but, somebody has a yeah. mic open probably online and we're hearing you talk besides Carter. So maybe everybody online talking, make sure, you can't get it on. Make sure your mics are shut off. And then Carter, go ahead. We have one mic open at the table here. Um, can you shut your mic off? Sorry. Yeah, your mic's live. Okay, go ahead, Carter. What were you saying? I activated mine. I, that is, I turned it from gray to black once I got the mic icon granted to me by clicking on the mute, unmute uh, icon at the top of the screen in the center. And then that activated it, and then I turned it off. And that's how I was able to make it okay. work. Well, maybe that'll help a few people online. Click on the mute, unmute, and then your mic becomes, you can activate your mic. That was what I was saying, Linda, is they haven't been given a mic yet. Well, right now the secretarial staff is busy pissing, picking, <laughs> handing out clickers. But once we get through that process, we'll figure out mics. Okay, why don't we send the B's over to get their <laughs> clickers? They're almost done with the A's. Um, so if your organization starts with, let's say, B or C, um, go over to get your clickers. So that would be Central Bering Sea Fishermen Association, um, Cape Barnabas. Well, he's not here. Cordova. Catch, yeah, that'd be you. Coastal Conservation Association.
Okay, let's send another batch of people over there. Let's try sending D's. I don't know if we have an E's, F's, G's. So it doesn't look like we have all that many. I don't have the list for Canada, but um, do they have many? No, no. Either. We have, we yeah, we have F's and H's. Okay, let's send H's over. Maybe we can do H, I, J, K even, because I don't see that many people in motion. Cruise off, do you have your clicker? <laughs> let's send you over too. Um, and did Linda go? Yeah. Okay, let's, what are, how far did we get to K? Let's go L through P. Seems like we're. That's not very many. Let's go all the way through S because we don't have that many people. So if your organization name starts anywhere in the alphabet up and through S, go pick up your clicker. 
either country. Looks like there's lots of Canadian S's, but I guess they're all online, huh? Okay, if there's anybody else who has not gotten their clicker yet, go ahead and get it. We'll just go to the end. So we have added on the U.S. side, Paul Wilkins from Coastal Villages has joined online. Um, Jim, is there anybody new from your side that's showed up since we called the roll? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. How many register, how many voters do you have on the Canadian side, just so we have a count? I don't know because I can't see the final product. Do you, he, he says he can't see. Do you? So I think we have 32 on the U.S. side. And, and then how about on the 20 on Canada, 32 on U.S.? Okay. Okay, I think we have everybody has their clicker. Um, Basha is going to give an explanation of how the vote voting is going to work. Um, and then for people online, because it's not that easy to see your hands, um, if your hand is up and we're not recognizing you, feel free to put something in the chat, like my hand's up, whatever, just so it's it's easier for us to make sure we're not missing you wanting to participate. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to give a little explanation. Thank you, and I hope the effort of distributing those liquors will be worth it. Can I have, please, the presentation on voting? 
So all of you have received a clicker. So this clicker is labeled with the name of your organization's acronyms. And uh, we have those organizations that have uh, ordered uh, alphabetically by acronym on the voting screen later. So when voting, there are a few things to, to keep in mind. You can change your vote as many times as you would like while the vote is open. The letter displayed on your screen on the, on the clicker is the vote that have been received. There are three options, A, yes, or the green button, B, no, or red button, and the abstain is the yellow button. Once your name on the screen has turned from gray to blue, uh, this is going to be during the voting process. This means that your vote has been received. You will not see the result of that vote until everybody else have voted and we close the vote. Chair will ask, uh, will be asking chair each time to uh, to notify us that uh, there's an intention to close the vote. And uh, so please make sure that the letter on your clicker is your final vote and we'll be closing the vote as per indication from the chair. When the vote is closed, we appreciate your patience while the IPHC Secretariat staff takes a few minutes to, hopefully it should be less, uh, to validate the voting results. And once the results are validated, we'll provide the full report of that voting uh, uh, split by country on the screen. A note from the secretariat, the, the clicker should not be uh, leaving the meeting room and should be staying here in, in the room, please. So do we have to pass them all out again in the morning? Yes. That's the plan. Can people leave them on their desk or is that not so safe? No there you go. Go. Um, we can just talk. I'm just trying to figure out how we avoid going through that slow process again tomorrow morning. So do you, can people leave them at their place in, in this room? And can, is that secure enough? Can we do that? Okay. All right. So when you leave the room, just leave it there at your place and go back to the same place in the morning or rearrange yourself with your clicker. Um, but yeah, we don't want to go through that again. Okay. Is that clear to everybody? Anything else? Did I cut you off? You're set. Well, I'm, I'm going to continue. Just for one oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So there will be some participants also uh, online, and we are prepared also to accommodate online voting. So for online voting, you will be prompted to enter your first and last name, enter the, enter the information, and you will be asked to enter the information exactly as provided in your email. We'll pro will not approve voting status to anyone trying to enter without. Uh, proper credentials. So we'll be going by the list of the uh, people who have been accredited. Okay, partly says I'm unmuted now that I've done it a bunch of times. Should I just... Okay, muted. Hey. Hello, am I unmuted finally? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Zeke from the from the guild. I'm just letting you know I'm present. Did you get the name? Zeke. Okay, thanks. Zeke. <clears throat> Gilman? Zeke Pellegrin. Yeah, I think so number 17. Got it. Okay. And I, I Tara, just so you know, there's still a number of people saying their mics aren't showing up. And hopefully we're got it. Okay, thanks. So soft. Okay, I'm gonna carry on. So online voters will appear at the end of the list of the voting grid and will have a red line next to their uh, acronym of the organization. If this is happening, uh, please refresh the page so that there is a green line by your, by your organization's acronym indicating that you, your status is active and the vote will be received. If, uh, please also notify if you are taking over the the online participant is taking over from the person in the room so that we can also send the, uh, the details on the online voting to these pe persons. So we'll be following up on uh, sending the information about the online voting uh, with the credentials. And this should be prepared by the secretariat to, to send over. Can you please confirm? 
So the people who have indicated that they are present, but online, they will be getting email with the credentials for, for voting. So th this might take a little bit of time, but we will definitely test the clickers now. So we are now planning to conduct a test vote. So if you could have your clickers, please, uh, ready uh, to respond to the question below. So the question is, for the test, did you enjoy the AM100 uh, reception to, uh, last night? So if you could cast your vote once the voting interfa interface appears on the screen. So please keep in mind that the voting interface has to be on the screen in order to receive that vote. So please give a secretary a second to, to initialize the, the voting software. Just don't get it wrong. Okay, so now the vote is open. Go ahead and pick one, two, or three if you haven't already. Or if they have already, should they again? They can vote. Yeah, go ahead and vote. And you can see the number. If the field is full, means the vote was cast. Right. Okay, Oops. Um, if everybody has had a chance to vote, your name should show up blue once you vote. Anybody having a problem not working? Yeah, what if you can't out. see your name on the list? Well, the, people, on, the people online, it's a separate system and they're still verifying your status to vote. So right now we're just checking the in in room clickers. But the number of names that are on the list are oh I see. Well, are there there names there of people who aren't in the room and are in the room? But I'm not in the room and my name's not on the list. Okay, so your in the your name is not appearing up there. My, my name's not appearing and I'm in the room. I know Chuck Ashcroft's name is up there. He's not in the room. He's online. We do yeah, have I'm names online, up we're there. seeing nothing. People who are not okay. in the so room. There's a couple of us here that aren't on that list. Okay. So I think I think that the the list for Canada, the revised list, I don't think it's gotten I don't think that's the one that's being used. I see. Yeah, Paul Clampett's not. Hey, Linda. All right. So what what Bosch is telling me is that they haven't been through the process of making sure the list is correct. This was just to make sure you knew how to use your clicker. They'll get all the names up there that we need before we have a real vote, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so before we have a real vote, we're going to make sure all your names are up there. <laughs> And we'll get the names off of groups, people who are not at the meeting. Clear as mud. Okay. All right. So I think we can move on. Roger. Hey, Linda. Yeah. Over here to your left. Yeah. You got FVOA as uh, Odegaard. If you yeah, could change so that, to, that's better color wise, by the way. Um, that, that's what I was saying. We're still getting the list right, evidently. Um, we just wanted to get the clickers out, show people how to use them. Before we have a real vote, we'll have the list sorted out <laughs> with the right names and the organizations that are here or not here. 
are we locked into using this format for voting? Uh, not my choice, but I think that's been, we're going to give it a go this meeting. Okay. <laughs> um, hopefully it, it's a better system, but if we don't like it, we will let the director know. Okay, so I guess when we, um, hmm. let so let's, uh, I think we can at least approve the agenda, hopefully without an objection. If we need to have a vote because somebody objects, then yes, we'll have to take a break there. But let's see if we can get the agenda approved and then let's take a little break and make sure we get our list sorted out because I do want to make sure it's set before we have any real vote. Um, and I have heard that there's a few additions to be made to the agenda. So um, if people can take a look at the agenda, the one addition I've been requested to add is to give um, Lane Solberg a chance to talk about the electronic logbook program. And we're going to add that under eight other business unless there's any objection to that Chris? so i've been at, i've been asked to add a thing uh a, an agenda item to the fishing periods okay jim let me see make sure there's no objection okay. to giving lang a chance to speak any objection okay we're good on that so go ahead jim so uh been asked to add the actual time you know the the, the hour, the, the timing of opening, like the time of day. So uh, looking at, you know, starting at 0600 and, and instead of 12 noon and um, ending at 2359 instead of 12 noon, which is that's basically what we do in Canada. So I will bring that up for, for discussion. Okay. Any objection to that, adding that? And I would just note for the secretariat, we should have enforcement in the room when we talk about, at least for the U.S., about changing that timing and if they have any concerns so they have a chance to flag them. We can we can have that arranged. Okay, great. Okay, any other additions? Linda Kozak, go ahead. Um, under item seven, and it may already be covered under this agenda item, but I would like to have a discussion about monitoring and a possible statement that we could uh, – uh, vote on and, and approve. Okay, any objection to that? I didn't quite hear that. So uh, a discussion about monitoring of catch in the commercial fishery. Okay. Okay, and then the one other request I had heard um, was around uh, giving providing an update on the abundance based management issue and the lawsuit, Jeff Kaufman, did you want time on the agenda to do that? Okay, and do you wanna do that uh, this afternoon before we dive into anything else or what's your, where would you suggest doing that? I think this afternoon would be fine. Okay, yeah, all right. At, at your convenience. All right, any objection to taking that update on that lawsuit? Uh, well, it would maybe help if we knew what it was. So I think we've been talking for a few years about the work to um, attach the bycatch caps for the trawl fishery to the abundance of the halibut stock in the Bering Sea, and that the North Pacific Council approved that uh, late in 21. Um, it's been implemented in the US. There's been a lawsuit filed in a number of groups that are planning to intervene. And I just wanted to give um, the Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association who are lead on that lawsuit on the intervener side a chance to speak to it, if that's okay with everybody. Chris? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine with that. Just when we have the discussion, can you just give kind of the Reader's Digest version yes. of the abundance space, man, just on the can side so we can understand it? Thanks. Yeah, I think that's the idea is to try and give you a little more background. Okay. Okay, so we'll add that. Um, 
why don't we, you want to do that? Well, let's just add that before we go into the informational session. Okay, so with those additions, uh, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Thank you, Byron. Uh, second to that? Second. Who's the second? Tom Gemmel, how the coalition? Okay, any objection? Seeing none, it passes. No objection online. You guys, somebody checking for me? <laughs> there's, there's no way to vote. <laughs> no way to vote. Okay, raise your hand if you object. I don't think there, I don't see any objections, but. Okay, great. Okay, so the agenda is adopted. Let's, let's take, what do you need? 10 minute break to get the names all sorted out. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll get the so, list so finalized. We, before we break, just want to know that um, <clears throat> Sean Cooper from the Council of Highland Nations is online now. It wasn't clear when we first started. Great. Okay. So we'll get the list sorted out. Be back in 10 minutes. We'll make sure everybody is up on the list that should be and everybody that's online has a way to vote, all of that. Okay. Just testing my mic. Can anybody hear me? Russell Cameron? We can hear you, Russell. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, how about we get smoke started again? Um, everybody ready? Uh, so while this, uh, the staff is still pulling together the list and making sure we have names right, I think we'll use this time to let Jeff talk about the abundance-based management action of halibut bycatch in the Bering Sea. And then we will um, check in with the staff to see how they're doing with lists. And just to, I, I forgot to say that we are breaking today at just a little before 4.30, like 4.25, because there's a U.S. delegation meeting that the commissioners have requested at 4.30. Um, so, or the U.S. commissioners have requested. So we're just going to work to 4.25 tonight. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we get the slide up on the screen, please? <clears throat> and hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to keep this pretty basic. Uh, one on one for Chris over here, and I've provided um, a little table as well as some um, <clears throat> some notes uh, to follow along with. So hopefully, it'll be a little bit easier to understand. Can we just wait till we get it up on screen, please, Jeff? Yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And I guess if we could zoom out a little bit, then they might uh, be able to follow along with the notes as well. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ABM. I'm going to talk less about the lawsuit today and more about uh, the ABM action and where we're at today. Well, we can touch on the lawsuit a little bit as well. 
But to start out, there's been two major uh, bycatch reduction efforts that have taken place in the Bering Sea since 2012. So if you look down past that table there, if you could scroll down, Barsha, into those first row of bullets. So we'll talk about this one first, and that's the overall BSAI bycatch cap was reduced by 23% in 2015. So that was an action that began in 2012. <clears throat> it took a lot of effort from uh, members of the Halbert community to come together and initiate such an action. At the time, they weren't ready to adopt an abundance-based approach to Halbert bycatch management. So what they did in, as an interim measure is they reduced the overall trawl PSC or bycatch limits by 23% in 2015. So prior to that, it was a fixed cap. And from 2015 to 2023, it was also a fixed cap. So that cap, regardless of abundance of halibut, stayed the same no matter what. The commercial directed, the directed commercial halibut fishery was bearing the brunt of conservation in low abundance years as quotas were being slashed and um, bycatch was coming off the top as a fixed amount. So this was the this was a big step forward, but the IPHC, I mean the, the North Pacific Council again identified this as an interim measure and in 2016 began to work on a larger action, which would be the second set of bullets there titled ABM bycatch reduced by 20% in 2024. So in 2016, it took, I guess overall we've been involved in this process uh, since 2012. So 11 or 12 years has taken us to get to where we are today. Again, interim measure in 2015, starting in 2016 and working all the way up through um, December of 2020, 20, September of 2021, the North Pacific Council finally took action. And at, at that stage, they adopted an abundance-based um, management of halibut bycatch program. So if we could slide back up to the table there. So again, before 2024, before right now, they were on a fixed, fixed PSC cap. And then as we, Moving to 2024 now, there is no more fixed PSC cap and they will, the PSC limit or the bycatch limit will slide with abundance. So as the abundance of fish goes down, so does the bycatch limit. If the abundance of halibut comes up in the Bering Sea, um, so does the bycatch limit. So, um, so based on the stat, so, so basically this is a lookup table and there's two abundance indices that are used to calculate what the halibut population uh, is doing in the Bering Sea. And one of those is the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey. The other one is the Area 4 A, B, C, D, E um, Fishery Independent Set Line Survey conducted by the APHC. So they take both of those. The trawl survey uh, captures mostly small fish and is a good indicator of the, the abundance of smaller fish. And the hook and line survey is uh, catches larger fish is a good indicator of fish that are over 26 inches in length. And so if you, Barsh, can you scroll down just a little bit more? There's a title up there. But looking on the very top there, it says the Eastern Bering Sea uh, Shelf Trawl Survey Index. And you've got two columns there. It's either high or low. And then on the other side, you've got the IPHC Set Line Survey. And there are high, medium, low, and very low states of that. And so basically each year when the IPHC calculates the abundance of fish and they, uh, they look at it, then they just, so they take the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey, they'll either categorize it as high or low, and you follow it across, and then you do the same uh, with the set line survey, and that'll put you in the box that you're in today. So the bycatch cap before 2024 was 1,745 metric tons, and as of January 2024, the new bycatch cap is 20% lower than it was last year at 1,396 metric tons. So this is a lookup table, and again, it provides for higher bycatch limits in, in high abundance years and lower bycatch limits in lower years, just like the commercial fishery operates. Um, the bycatch cap will be uh, recalculated annually based on two abundance indices, the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey, I already covered that, and the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey. Um, bycatch limits, if you look at this table here, you could see in the lowest abundance in both the Set Line Survey and in the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey, if you get down to those lowest abundance levels, it would be a 35% reduction for the bottom trawl sector um, over the previous bycatch limit of 1,745 metric tons. So today we are in the high column for the EBS trawl survey and in the low column for the larger fish in the set line survey index. So you can see there that puts us at 1,396 metric tons going into 2024. Uh, final action was taken. Uh, the final rule was published, and this rule is going into effect in 2024. And these uh, new lower bycatch limits were incorporated into the catch the groundfish catch limits set 
for the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands in December of 2023. So there was one other, so we have the, the fixed cap reduction in 2015. We got 20% reduction based on abundance based management in 2024 coming. And then there was a, another big effort by the North Pacific Council to reduce um, trawl by ketchup halibut. And that was in the trawl cod fishery in the Bering Sea Aleutian Island region. When that fishery was recently rationalized, the North Pacific Council cut their bycatch limit in that particular sector as well by 25%. And so there have been some really major reductions. And if you could see all the way down there at the bottom where it says final word, I think this really summarizes where we were and where we are today. And so the MM and 80 bycatch limit in area four and MM and 80 is the bottom trawl sector. And so in this most recent action, the only one impacted by that was the bottom trawl sector, but they're responsible for the vast majority of halibut bycatch in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island region. So their limit in area four um, prior to 2015 was 2,325 metric tons or about 5.1 million pounds. So prior to 2015, the bycatch cap was 5.1 million pounds. After 2013, when they reduced the cap by 25, uh, by 25%, the Amendment 80 limit went to 1,745 metric tons or 3.8 million pounds. So from 5.1 million pounds, the bycatch cap was reduced to 3.8 million. And then there was the most recent action that took place. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the current bycatch limit under this one is 3 million pounds. So overall, there's a reduction of 929 metric tons or 2.05 million pounds in the bycatch limit a 40% reduction overall from 2015 to today. So I think we've taken this very seriously. Members of the, the Halbert community, for, there, there's communities, there's small boat fishermen, there's support businesses, there's people from all over and associations from across Alaska and down into Washington that have supported this effort on behalf of uh, communities and small boat fishermen. Um, so it was a major achievement. And I don't know of any other bycatch uh, reduction efforts that were quite as successful as this one. It was hard and it was long, but I think the results are good and I think that it will help. And we've actually seen some of those over 26 inch fish through the bycatch reduction in 2023. Now that some of those fish are rolling into the directed fishery for the upcoming season. So um, with that, I, I guess I would be happy to entertain any questions. Just kind of a brief overview, no specifics, but uh, if you got any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Go ahead. Um, just curious regarding the, um, it's uh, reassessed every year. And then if it's reassessed every year and the, we go to like a, uh, for the set line survey to a uh, biannual or triannual survey, how, how is that going to factor in, in the, um, in, in the, um, the reassessment of, of what the bycatch cap would be. Um, because you'd only be doing the survey every second or third. Year. Yeah, this is this is a, a little bit of a problem. And the Amendment 80 sector flagged this particular issue of no set line survey in the Bering Sea in the 2023 season. And so how do you set the abundance indices without that particular survey? So there's space time modeling. Uh, I think the IPHC sent a response to them and I don't recall the details of it, but the space time modeling somehow will capture the lack of that survey in that particular year. And so they're looking at other areas, I think of like kind, uh, as well as the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey and some calculations that they use. Apparently they're fairly confident uh, in the number that they're using to set the bycatch limits this year. But again, they will be, uh, the deck will be reshuffled every year. They'll look at the abundance indices of those, those two different indexes. And then um, we'll set a new PSC limit every December at the North Pacific Council for the upcoming, the following season. So having surveys every year is going to be really, really critical. And I think we're all pushing on that. I think we heard the scientists say this morning too, they told the, uh, I think they were telling the commissioners that it is important and that there will be data gaps if we continue to do this. I, maybe in the short term, it's okay, but over long term, I'm not sure that it's okay. And so making sure that the Bering Sea gets surveyed in 2024 is going to be really critically important. And it, it will, of course, see the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey, but having a set line survey in, in that area, I think, will be really critical uh, moving forward for this action and, and just in general. Uh, and then just like a, a follow up regarding, um, I've been looking at the, the FIS survey and how they're kind of breaking it into blocks. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's going to have implications for our fishery as well, but I mean, for the Bering Sea, I assume that with the space time model, that they're, the IPHC secretary is comfortable enough that they can work it out by having the like not a full coverage, but like partial coverage every so often. Is that correct? They do, they do a calibration. Yeah, they do. Calibrate. 
calibration tournament to sort of this happens. Okay, so there's a calibration of the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey that can then convert into um, the, the values, the equivalent values that, that feed into the FIS. Oh, the equivalent values that feed into the FIS. Yeah, so I think I think uh, the larger fish are informed by the smaller fish that they're catching in the in the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey. Go ahead, Chris. I, I would just say that we are going to have um, Ray coming in under the next agenda item, the informational session. So if you have any questions about the survey and yeah. the, sort of what you're asking that you also want to pitch to Ray, yeah. I'll have that opportunity. Go ahead, Chris. Just wondering if we can get a copy of this. Sure. Is that, yeah, I, thank you. Sure. Any other I, questions or comments? <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, th yeah, thanks, um, Jeff. So uh, just a couple things. So I remember, you know, seeing this originally a few years ago, and it was just the um, it was just the A80 fleet. So now that the abundance base is, is sort of goes over to all the other kind of fleets that the trawl fleets in the Bering Sea, or because it looks like it's the the trawl cod fishery as well. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. So in the action in 2015 actually incorporated all trawl sectors. So everybody was included in that action. When the North Pacific Council decided to move forward with ABM action and they looked at it, um, they decided to only apply it to the Amendment 80 sector, which is responsible. That's the bottom trawl sector in Alaska and is, is responsible for the vast majority of the halibut bycatch. Other fisheries have been somewhat rationalized. And I, I think um, uh, so. Yeah, I forgot where I was going to go with that, but um, that's okay. That's all right. I did the, I have another another sort of question. Actually, it's just a clarification. So, and 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 it's probably because I don't understand the thing. But it's one is the trawl survey says it's a high abundance, and the, and the IPHC set line survey is low abundance. So, I, at least that's why I looked at the table. I um, are, because are they measuring two different things? Yeah, so basically, I think that they are. The set line survey measures uh, the abundance of larger fish, and the set line survey measures abundance of the smaller fish. Okay, so if the if the, the trawl survey is measuring the, the smaller fish, and the set line survey is measuring this bigger fish, uh, where's the, where's what is most weighted as to what the abundance what you use for your abundance level? What survey data is it? The trawl, or is it the IPHC stuff? So they're they're mostly they're basically clear. equally weighted. You use that lookup right. table, and so where the abundance is falling under each of those surveys determines where you are in the lookup table with yep. high, medium, and low. And the I mean, there is yep. some, of course, the trawl survey gets some small fish and some larger fish, but it does pick up the fish under 32 inches that we don't get many of those in the set line survey. So while they aren't like just big fish and just little fish between yeah. the two surveys or some yeah, overlap. Yeah, I get that. I just sort of yeah. how, how it's weighted and how it, because it's, because they'll be looking at different portions of the population, right? Yeah. And they're, I think Linda was correct in that they're weighted equally. Okay. Those two okay. Uh, survey ind uh, indices. And, and so I guess back to your, um, your other question a little bit, the action in 2015, again, applied to all trawl sectors. In this action that is going into effect in 2024, they only applied that to the bottom trawl sector. And again, they're responsible for most of the bycatch. And then in the then the, the trawl cod fishery in Alaska hadn't been rationalized it, and it was still a little bit of a derby style fishery and it was it was causing concerns for helmet and such. And so when they rationalized that fishery, they also took a 25% uh, bycatch reduction in, uh, in the the cod trawl sector and so not all sectors are impacted by this most recent action everybody was impacted by the first one um and then okay, the second well, was more specific yeah to, yeah maybe the presentation be good but thanks a lot it was good thanks go ahead yeah so we could touch um uh, so in december of 2020 so the final rule was published in um or the the, the action was um approved in December of 2021, I think. And then it was a year or so before NIMS came out with the final rules and uh, it was out for public comment and public review. Um, and then in 
I think it was in November of 2024, the final rule was issued um, and it was posted. And at that point, Amendment 80 had 30 days to, to sue NIMS if they chose to do that. So the Amendment 80 sector has filed a lawsuit um, against the National Marine Fisheries Service saying that this action is um, not appropriate for numerous reasons. And so there's a bunch of us from Alaska, uh, from Washington, I don't know how many associations, but a number of uh, US associations have banded together to act as interveners in the lawsuit on the side of NIMS. And so we have an attorney, we're prepping documents now, we're working collaboratively together and we're trying to make sure that this thing really sticks for the long run. If it doesn't stick, it's a bad day. And basically our fishery in the Bering Sea would, you know, getting the leftovers over and over, it's, it's not sustainable at all. And so uh, I don't know where this lawsuit will go. Um, the, the new bycatch limits are in place. They've been activated. They are in place for the upcoming season. I don't know what will happen with the lawsuit, but there is one currently going on. And uh, I don't know how long it will take. Go ahead, Chris. Have they set like court dates or anything like that? I'm not the best person to ask. Maybe Linda knows. Yeah, not, not yet. So um, the there's a, a period when interveners can apply for standing to intervene probably similar to situations you're used to. We're still in that process. Once they get their list and, you know, we sort of know the slate, then I imagine there will be some deadline set. Um, but we're anticipating, uh, I, I think the last prediction I saw is that sometimes towards the end of the year, we may see a determination. And there are 11 organizations right now, my understanding, that have intervened in the lawsuit on the side of the federal government. So, sorry, just to clarify, you think the courts will rule by the end of this year? There, there's some hope that they might. Of course, they're not under a, no. yeah, you know how courts work, but that's, they will, the Amendment 80 has asked for ex, expedited decision making under Magnuson Act um, because they want to see this set aside. So, yeah, we're, we're hopeful that that's the timeline. Okay, thank All you. Right. Uh, Angus has his hand up, apparently. Go ahead, Angus. I do, yeah. I, I was just curious. Are are the midwater trawl fleets there observed to the same degree that the bottom trawl fleets are? Yeah. So again, the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask that, but I 100%. know that the CP Pollock CP boats are 200% observed, and I think the smaller boats have 100% observer coverage on them as well. Um, the new trawl cod program that's coming into effect that requires 100% observer coverage as well. Before it was in a partial coverage category. In addition to getting the bycatch reductions, uh, we also got that. Um, okay, thanks very much. Oh, uh, I think Patty Phillips online has a, a comment or question. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I was wondering if there's like a white paper or a summary of this, you know, that briefs about this lawsuit. Thank you. Um, yes, we can provide that. I know we have one on our website. I imagine other people do as well, but happy to provide that to you, Patty. Oh, I can go to the Alpha website and get it. Thank you. Tom Marking has his hand up. Go ahead, Tom. We, we can't hear you. Is his mic enabled? It was you might, before. You might be on mute, Tom. Oh, okay. I finally unmuted. No, I was just curious. Is this, is this an amicus brief in support of them? I think there's a difference between the amicus brief and the and being an intervener. And I think the intervener is a, is a higher level. Yeah, so there's a group, 11 organizations that are, will move to intervene. The state of Alaska plans to file a amicus brief or amicus brief, whatever it's called, um, is, my, is our current understanding. So we, the 11 organizations all contributed money to the pot. So we have quite a sum of money to work with right now. We have a decent sum of money to work with right now. That was uh, donations from the 11 organizations that are participating. And we're also, uh, there's some ongoing or upcoming uh, fundraising events to help pay for that as well. It's going to be very expensive. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Oh, Chris, sorry. Sorry. And this is probably, I just remember the last, 
was last year or two years ago, there was that Alaska bycatch task force. And I, I think, I think one of the recommendations was also to consider uh, abundance based management uh, or abundance based caps in the, in the Gulf of Alaska in area three. I, I might've read that wrong. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if there's any progress on that or, or, or is this kind of halted any progress or was it, was it real to begin with? Just uh, any news there? No, I think that was very real recommendations um, from the task force to our governor and Linda Kozak, I think was chair of that committee. And I'll just give you the floor to talk about where that stands. Thank you. Um, the Alaska Bycatch Review Task Force had a, a report to the governor in 2022, and that was one of the recommendations that abundance-based management be looked at in the Gulf. The commissioners has since formed a Alaska Bycatch Advisory Council, and I'm am the chair of that group. There are six of us on the on the um, on the ABC, and so what we are doing is. Um, we are looking at, and there's a progress report that you can you can look at. We're looking at all of the task force recommendations, and then we are making recommendations to the commissioner to the state of Alaska on how they should move forward in a good, a stepwise manner. Because there were so many recommendations, they can't physically do them all. There's not enough staff time. But um, we do have a progress report. If you go to the state of Alaska Fishing Game website and put in bycatch, it should come up through the ABRT. And then you can see the progress report of the actions that have already been implemented. And there have been several for the Gulf that are what we feel uh, significant actions that are being looked at. So, um, but as far as ABM in the Gulf, that action has not uh, it's not been, it's being discussed, but it has not been put into progress yet. But there's been some other actions taken, you said? Yes, okay, yes, I'll take quite a few report. from the from the various recommendations that were made under three different categories, research, state engagement, and management recommendations. Thanks. And I can speak with you offline with some more information if you if you need it. Okay, we get everybody. Creel, if you want to take a seat at the table, you are part of this group. <laughs> um, all right, great. Well, I think we, how are we doing on our list? Do we want to do that next or do we want to go to the information information session? Do we have any voting, Hug? No, but we wanted to make sure everybody's name was appearing that was supposed to be appear before we had a motion on the floor. Maybe we better wait on that. Okay, let's let's go ahead to the information session because I don't think we have any voting on that. Um so this this everybody's had a chance to hear I think a couple of different times from staff on mortality limits on the MSE on the FIS but we wanted to make sure before we got into conversations and motions that conference board members had a chance to refresh your memory to ask questions so first up will be um, Ian Stewart and he's been asked to join us is that correct not yet. Oh, I thought it was on his way. I'm sorry. It's gone to get shortly. Okay. So so Ian Ian will be here shortly and we'll Yeah, and then I think we have Alan coming to answer any additional questions on the management strategy evaluation. And then we'll have Ray on the fist. Sorry, I thought we had Ian already on his way. So I don't expect that Ian's gonna give a full presentation. I had asked him to think about maybe just a few slides that gave the high level of what's happening in each area. So maybe we can get that pulled up. Um, or did he give you slides he wanted to put up? 
Yes, Secretariat, can we please bring Ian Saradu's presentation for the conference board? So evidently, Ian is um, answering questions at the pub. So we're hoping we're going to get Alan or Ray. I mean, we we could start discussion about opening limits if, if it's going to be a little while. Sure, we could have at least a conversation about that. I don't know. Yeah, we're and not to make, make motions, but just start having some conversations. Sure. People want to talk about season opening dates while we're waiting for. Go ahead, Phil. Um. I prepared a prepared a motion to make for um, for the opening date, and I I don't know if we're we're going to take action on it or not, but I can get it out there, and I'll speak to the motion after I make it if I get a second. So I, I, I don't think we're really ready to prepared to take okay, motion right now. Motion. I want to have some discussion. Okay. Well, I just know that um, we've always had a kind of debate over the start of the season, and we've always uh, had different views on when to open, but. There's so much turbulence going on in the marketplace, especially for Black Cod and Black Cod and Halibut opened the same date in in Alaska. So that's something consideration. Another consideration is to open it sooner. We just heard from Canada, and I think I think most fishermen would probably support fishing eight or nine o'clock in the morning. But that's up to that's up to um, enforcement and Coast Guard to to decide that in Alaska. So until we hear from them, it's hard to move off the noon opening date. So, um, but anyway, I recommended um, March 15th. It's a, it's a Friday and sometimes we've opened on Saturdays, but Friday covers a lot of the bases. Um, 
uh, the one the one thing is it'll cover is that the uh, by Friday the, the tides are the smallest for about a week or ten days, and so um, earlier in the month that the tides are pretty big tides, and so we have to take that in consideration with the fact in South in, in all all of Alaska we have pots. Black cod operation fisheries started at the same time as the halibut fishery, so we've got the you know the, there'll be a lot of boats on the grounds, and so it'd be best to have have a date there where everybody had better weather to go fishing on, a little bit more daylight. And so I came up with that date too, is after, I basically always go out opening day. And so this last year kind of got to where you see how the fresh market works and that's what we're all relying on for best prices. And so you open Friday, it doesn't conflict, on Friday the 15th, it doesn't conflict with the Boston Seafood Show. And that's a week previous. Easter's at the end of the month, so those are always concerns. But what the what March the Friday works better than Saturday is because the processors all don't want to work weekends now, and they don't, and they would like to get the uh, fish into the plants by fr uh, by Monday or Tuesday at, at and Wednesday noon at the latest, because they have to know they got the fish in hand, and basically at the air freight offices. For the for the Thursday through Sunday supermarket sales and also for the restaurant chain. So basically, Friday probably works the best for all of us because I think we're all involved in fresh sales now for 90, 95% of our catch. So so those are the thoughts I put through. I I don't think it's I think we keep getting feedback from the RAM division as far as getting our IFQ uh, statements out as far as our when we can go fishing. So they're always don't like the first of March. So those are all the concerns that I have. And so um, I, I think it's a fair date for the small boat versus big boat scenario. And it gives everybody a chance to have a little bit better weather on the small tide. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Linda, go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We've, we've always been consistent in our group in coming to the conference board with the desire to have as long of a season as possible, recognizing that under the IFQ fishery, that people can pick and choose when they go with their markets and, and each area has different uh, considerations. But we think for the most part, to have the longest possible fishery benefits, the resource benefits the consumers, uh, benefits the industry so that they can pick and choose when they want to um, harvest. And we would prefer uh, either March 7th or 9th uh, to be the opening date. And um, again, um, you know, as late in the year as possible into December if possible. Hey, thanks, Linda. Maybe I'll take one or two more comments if people want to make them. And then I see Ian is here. So I, I before we lose them, we'll you have, a, you have a Canadian, anyone? Yeah, Chris is, it out. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, <clears throat> we've talked, what are, we agree that, you know, we would like to see as long a season as possible, as much opportunity as possible for, for everyone. Um, so we were hoping, we we're, were thinking of a March 1st opening date. That's also a Friday. Um, and then obviously closing in December. I know we're not talking about that, but, you know, we're December 7th to 14th is what uh, we're talking about. One thing I did want to, put on the table for everyone to think about is we, you know, the opening time and the closing time, you know, we open at noon, we close at noon. Uh, we were thinking, you know, could we open at 0600 and then people can get a full day of fishing in that, that first day you get a full day of fishing in and then closing the fishery at 2359. So again, you've got a full day. Um, so again, uh, something to think about. We just wanted to, to bring it up. Uh, we discussed that. So that's sort of the thinking uh, from the Canadian side at this point. So thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, let's take one more and then we'll go to Ian. Go ahead, Kareel. From our KB organization, we had a um, suggestion for the board to start earlier and uh, end earlier due to for also fresh market and end of the season, most of the canneries are already shut down anyways. Um, and it's really hard for fishermen to go and find a market. Let's say in December, like few, these few past few years, the fishing usually closed down by November 30th. 
and December they were just there was no markets to sell the fish to King Cove or the Charber. But I'm not sure about Homer area here. Just a suggestion from our side. Thanks, Creel. Okay, let's just put this discussion on hold for right now. We'll go give Ian a chance to go just a few high level slides on uh, mortality limits and then everybody has a chance to ask their questions before we get to motions on that. So thanks Ian. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks. This should be fun to run the mouse from over here. Uh, you guys have all probably heard enough of me already this week, um, but I, I did. I was in, informed that you'd like a, just a brief recap of the stock assessment and um, perhaps some additional information on uh, non-directed discard mortality or bycatch as well. So I put those both of those slides together just to avoid us having to, to change gears here. But I'll, I'll start with the stock assessment summary, and then at, at your convenience, I can either speak to bycatch or, or save that for later when you get to it in your agenda. Okay, so I just put a few of the trend figures in here um, to, to recap the data that we have this year and the trends that we're seeing. Um, I've tried to include a few figures that had perhaps a little more regional or area specific information just for your convenience. As I stated in the uh, yesterday in the main assessment uh, presentation, we saw just modest declines in the survey across numbers and weight per unit effort, with the biggest change being in region three, as you can see here, 8% down. Uh, this is all sizes weight per unit effort, so it's reflecting both the age structure and the size at age in the population of all the fish that we capture on the FIS. And again, as I mentioned um, in the main assessment presentation, Although we estimate a 5% increase for IPHC regulatory area 4B, I wouldn't put a lot of credence in that because we didn't have any direct sampling there in 2023. And so the, the, the confidence intervals are wide enough that actually the trend there could actually be flat or increasing. Um, compare that to the O32 weight per unit effort. So this is the most directly comparable to the commercial fishery. You see, in general, the trends are similar. There's a percent difference here or there. Um, I, those are probably not um, clearly interpretable as meaningful differences. Uh, the overall, the similar patterns occur across the different regions. Uh, this figure shows the, the complexity of the fishery, both across space and among gear types, uh, and the different fisheries occurring. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to spend on this in the main presentation. Uh, I would say with regard to IPHC regulatory area 2A in particular, the tribal and non-tribal fisheries there occur in different places and at different times. And so it's we have consistently over the years seen some big differences between the catch rates that are observed in those fisheries. I'd also note that 2A for both of these is still a, a derby fishery. Uh, so it's conducted over a very short time window, uh, but not the same time window for the tribal and non-tribal fisheries. The other thing I will point out here is that some of these combinations of gear and area are still pretty sparse in terms of the data that we have. We didn't have all of the logbooks available to us at the beginning of November. And so this, this reflects the information that was available for the stock assessment. Um, but I would expect to see some changes, particularly, for example, in 2B, you'll note a pretty bit large drop in the fixed gear trend. Uh, but I think that we had very few logs yet uh, submitted on the fixed gear in 2B at the time that, that we finalized this for the uh, stock assessment purposes. Madam Chair, I've got a question on this unless we should wait till the end of May. Uh, you want to ask a question? Did you have another slide, Ian? Or? I do. I'm happy to take questions now or at the end. Either yeah, what, while you have the I slide up. The end, or, no, I oh. think while you have the slide up, go ahead and ask and then we'll Good okay, um, there's some discussion about how to um, parse out uh, parse out the, the shift to 2012 year class and its contribution to uh, commercial WPE dropping 
and and then let's just you know scratch your fishing. And um, one of the um, one of the thoughts was that if the FIS uh, WPUE is down, or yeah, if FIS WPUE is down X amount, would would that be sort of a proxy for what portion? Like if it, if it was down two or if it was down three, but uh, the commercial WPUE in the same area was down ten. Could you say seven percent is scratchy fishing and three percent is or seven uh, percent is a shift to the twenty twelve year class? Or I I just I don't even know if I'm making sense of myself at this point. But is there a way to really get you know to to make some sense as as what parts are contributing? Yeah, thanks for the question. I I don't think there's a simple way to partition the difference between the two, mainly because I I'm not sure that we understand fully the reasons why the fishery's down farther um, than the the fishery independent set line survey. I think there's a, several potential contributors there. One important difference is that we're able to correct for whale depredation in the survey index. So we essentially factor that out where that's going to be embedded in the, the log books, both the primary effect of whales reducing the catch rate on sets where they're depredating, but also the secondary effect of trying to avoid those areas in the first place and ending up experiencing lower catch rates um, because your fishing is occurring in places where hopefully the whales aren't going to be. Um, so that that's that's definitely a contributor. I do think that there is a component of targeting of larger and older fish. Um, the the fishery is consistently and not surprisingly way better at catching larger older fish than the survey is. But in a period like we're in right now where those larger older fish are rapidly disappearing as the 2005 year class is becoming less and less important. I think to the degree that the fishery was catching the last bit of the, that year class and the survey was just sampling across space evenly, um, it's, it's possible that there could have even been lower catch rates in some fishing operations because the goal was to catch those larger, more valuable fish rather than a potentially a slightly higher catch rate of smaller, less valuable fish. So I guess the, the short answer to your question is I don't think it's easy to, to necessarily partition the whole thing out. Okay, thank you. And one follow-up if I might. And then just, um, it just would make stand a reason that if you were, you know, you had a 10 fish or 15 fish on a skate of gear and they were averaged 40 pounds and, and then you're switching to a 20, 12 year class that are 11, year, 11 years old and they're 20 pounds or whatever they are, that that'd be a natural a natural shift a natural drop in WPE as well. Would you classify that as correct? Yeah, I would. I would agree. Although I, I would note that we didn't see a huge drop in the average weight of a landed fish. So there's it's it's there's there's some complexity there. There's even even you know as we say that the most numerous year class in the catch was the 2012s, but there are still a lot of other year classes in there that are being caught to some degree. So it's not. It's not quite as simple as just a, a, a clear switch from one to the other. Good to know. Thanks so much. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Oh, that, sorry, Linda. Whoop. Oh, yeah, sorry. Could I ask a question just since it's on the same slide? Sure. Yep. So, Ian, uh, I appreciate you giving us a difference, the difference like the snap and the fixed gear, but um, I'm just curious, like, like take 4A, for instance, you have minus 27 for fixed, zero for snap. But how can we tell what the overall is? Is, is that provided anywhere or because? I mean... Yeah, thanks for the question. So we, there's a lot of different ways to display this information. And I've, I've tried to give you the most detailed information here. There's a similar figure to this um, in the data overview document that's on the website that provides the, the, um, the non-gear specific trends. But I can I can quickly summarize for you how we do that. So in 2A and 2B, the trend that we use in the stock assessment is a um, is an average of the two, weighted by the the difference in catch rate, uh, the two gear types. In for 2C through um, 4C D and E, the the primary index that we use in the stock assessment is just the fixed gear index. And that's been the case for, for some time. So we're reporting the information here for, for comparison. Um, but because still today, the majority of the fishing in Alaska is done with fixed gear, um, we, we use that as the primary index rather than combining gear types. Go ahead, Ryan. I guess this kind of 
ties into what Malcolm just said, and I just want to make sure I understand it. So, um, our, I mean, let's see, you look at 4A, the way I read it is, you know, potentially there could be one snap on boat and they just had the exact same catch rate as the year before. And there could be, you know, thousands of fixed hook boats. And so obviously that data is a lot more important. Um, you're saying that that information can be found somewhere else? Yeah, thanks for the question. So I, I don't I don't think we currently are reporting the fraction of the landings from each gear type, at least in a location that I'm aware of. There may be somewhere in our time series data sets. Um, you're right to the degree that these aren't going to be equal sample sizes in each panel. However, um, the, the variance estimates, so the, the vertical line on each point is going to reflect um, the uncertainty in the information and where we have very small stocks, very small um, sample sizes, you are going to see a larger variance estimate. So I, I don't think we have any cases where there's there's a, quite as a large an imbalance as, as you mentioned, but um, you would see if we had just, just a small number of vessels contributing, you would see a larger variance um, on that index. I'm sorry, I, I can't actually see those vertical lines from where I'm sitting, but I think there are a few examples in there where you can see some some wider confidence intervals in some um, for some gear types in some years. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Uh, sorry, Dr. Stewart, can you explain again how you use 2A and 2B in the in the stock assessment? I missed it. Yeah, so 2A and 2B are somewhat unique in that the majority of fishing in those areas is snap gear. And so we can't do the same thing we do in Alaska where we um, we use only the fixed gear index. The sample size would be very small in those two areas. So what we do is we use the historically estimated um, offset between the two gear types and effectively multiply, um, divide the snap gear by that offset because snap gear is a smaller amount and um, combine that with the fixed gear estimate. So that, that offset is 75%. So we, on average, in those areas, uh, snap gear historically has produced 75% of the catch rate. Um, so that's that's how those two things are put together there. Each each set is weighted equally, um, but the catch rates for snap gear are adjusted upward by um, dividing by 0.75. And that's, that's nothing new. That's been the case for a number of years. I will um, mention that we... Several years ago now, about seven, I think it was 2016, we did a fairly large analysis where we used a sophisticated statistical model similar to the space-time model that we use for the survey. We used all three gear types. I, I'm not reporting auto line gear here, but we do get records from auto line gear as well. We used all three gear types um, and we did a similar analysis. And at that time we got um, very similar results using all three gear types. In a, in a much more sophisticated process. And when we, we've discussed this with our scientific review board, they encouraged us to stick with something fairly simple and but to report the detailed information so that everybody could see the catch rates and, and evaluate it for themselves. So at that time, they recommended no, no major change to our approach. Just a quick follow-up question then. So for the 75%, was that is that a number generated a few years ago or is that something generated each year? No, that's been the same offset for a, a long period of time. That hasn't that hasn't changed in more, okay, than, I more just than know, 20 like, years. We're yeah. we're down to a handful of fixed gear bolts now. I, it's probably maybe I don't know, 10, 10, Less than 10, 11, maybe. Right. So it's usually, you know, like 145 to 155 bolts fish each year, and maybe 10 of them are fixed gear. Right. So the majority of the index is going to be driven by snap gear and mm -hmm. 2B, and similarly in 2A. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I might follow up there. There's many different ways of rigging up snap gear. Are you using a different model for each kind of snap gear? Because we, I know in, in Canada anyway, when we're reporting the kind of gear type we use, we have to be very specific about what snap gear we use. Do you have a metric for distinguishing the different kinds of snap gear or is it a 0.75 across the board? It is just a simple correction across the board. Uh, we, we do recognize that there are different ways to rig the swivels. Um, we, when we did the analysis in 2016, we actually looked at swivel location, hook, ganyan, or both. We also looked at hook size. And just given the 
huge amount of variability in these data sets, we didn't see a strong effect of either of those on the overall trend and catch rate. And I think that's something that, that's important to remember is that the absolute scale of these things is not terribly important for the stock assessment. What's important is the trend in this information. And so we're getting very similar trends regardless of how we treat the data. And that's why I, th I, I but I do still think because um, we're using, just because we're using an aggregate index in the assessment doesn't mean it isn't useful to look at these, these trends individually. And so I, some of you will recall, and I think it was right after that analysis in 2016 that we first started separating these routinely and reporting this, this level of, of information so that everybody could see the trends in both gear types. And I would, I would produce the auto line trends as well, although there's a small enough number of vessels that in many places I wouldn't be able to show them just for confidentiality reasons. So for clarity, we've, we've left that off, but we do recognize that, that auto line boats are submitting their logs. We, we, we have looked at that information and to date, it's not told us something appreciably different than the other two sources, but I, I certainly do appreciate those vessels that are using auto line gear, reporting their catch rates and, and you know, participating and providing that information. Chris, is that a raised hand or is that just a waving around hand? Okay, waving hand, okay. All right, any other conference board members question? Okay, we'll, we'll let you carry on, Ian. Okay, so my next slide, I was kind of anticipating, we had some questions at the interim meeting um, and I, I thought it might be helpful to, to give you